around 500 BC, when they made the transition away from the traditional monarchical form of government used up to that point by themselves and most other Italian cities, and created the Roman Republic. Like much else in early Roman history, exactly how this crucial moment came about is shrouded in a dense accretion of later mythologizing and propaganda. As with other semi-historical tales of early Roman heroes, however, the story that the Romans tell of the end of the monarchy and the beginning of the Republic is worth looking at, if for no other reason than for what it reveals about the Romans' core values and how they wanted to view themselves. While nearly all of the stories about early Roman heroes recounted by the Roman historian Livy focus on men, this particular story revolves around a Roman woman named Lucretia, and it involves a number of dramatic elements, including a contest of wives, a rape, and a suicide. If the stories of early heroes like Mucius, Horatius, and Cincinnatus were the ones that Roman parents told to their sons, Lucretia was the role model they presented to their daughters. The king who ruled Rome at the time was Lucius Tarquinius Superbus, and he was of Etruscan origin. At least in the traditional view, the Romans had more and more come to resent being ruled over by what amounted to a foreign nobility. The name Tarquinius Superbus means Tarquinius the Proud, and as his name implies, he was not a nice person, but supposedly was arrogant and ruled by fear. He had several senators murdered, did not take advice from the Senate, surrounded himself with a bodyguard, and in general is depicted as conforming to the stereotypical image of a tyrant. As Lucretia's tale begins, the Roman army is encamped around an enemy city, laying siege to it. A group of young Romans, including Tarquinius the Proud's son, who was named Sextus Tarquinius, were sitting around the campfire, drinking and boasting. Each asserted that he had the best wife. Unable to resolve the argument, at last one of them hit on a solution to put the question to the test and determine whose wife was most virtuous. He urged them to ride back to Rome in the middle of the night, burst into their respective homes, surprise their wives, and see what they were up to while their husbands were away in the field fighting, stating that the truest test of a wife is to return home unexpectedly and surprise her. Being all a bit drunk, they readily agreed to this plan, jumped on their horses, and rode back to Rome. To their disappointment, at house after house, when they burst in, they found their wives eating, gossiping, and partying with their female friends. Finally, they arrived at Lucretia's house. They found her alone, except for her servants, sitting and spinning cloth by the light of a single lamp. Clearly, she was the most virtuous wife and won the contest. Unfortunately, her display of womanly virtue attracted an unwanted admirer. Sextus Tarquinius, the king's son, became filled with a villainous lust for Lucretia. A few days later, he returned to Lucretia's house alone. As befits an honored guest, Lucretia served him dinner and let him stay in the guest room. When everyone else was sound asleep, Tarquinius crept into Lucretia's bedroom and threatened to kill her unless she had sex with him. Despite this dire threat, Lucretia stoutly resisted his advances, stating she would prefer death. Unable to overcome her with physical threats, Tarquinius then switched tactics and said that he would murder both her and one of her male slaves and then place their naked bodies in bed together so that everyone would believe that she had been discovered committing shameful adultery with a slave. Threatened with this disgrace, Lucretia gave in. 
Tarquinius raped her and then left. Lucretia promptly sent a messenger to her husband and her father, instructing them to come at once and to each bring a trustworthy friend. Her husband brought a man named Lucius Junius Brutus. When they arrived, she related what had happened, stating, Only my body has been violated. My mind is free of guilt, as death will be my witness. Swear by your right hands and promise that the rapist will be punished. He is Sextus Tarquinius. They all swore the oath and tried to comfort her, but she replied, As for me, although I acquit myself of guilt, I do not absolve myself from punishment. Never let any unchaste woman live by citing me as an example. She then took out a knife, which she had kept concealed under her clothes, and plunged it into her heart. Holding the dagger, dripping with her blood, up in the air, Brutus then proclaimed, I swear by this blood most pure until a prince polluted it, and I call upon you, the gods, to witness my oath that I shall pursue Tarquinius the Proud, his evil wife, and all their children with fire, sword, and all other force I possess, and I will not allow them or anyone else to rule as king at Rome. Brutus and the others present led a rebellion against the entire Tarquin family, with the ultimate result that the Tarquins were expelled from Rome. The Romans then established the Roman Republic, and Brutus was elected as one of its first consuls, or chief magistrates. When we analyze the story of Lucretia, we really have to divide it up into two distinct parts, the contest of the wives and her rape and the establishment of the Republic. The first section establishes Lucretia as the ideal of Roman womanhood. Whereas the other wives are discovered gossiping with one another and socializing, Lucretia is found in her own home, industriously working and supervising the labor of her servants. It's particularly significant that what she is doing is sewing. In the ancient world, generally, one of the most important duties and economic contributions of women was to weave fabric and sew clothing. Even as far back as Homer's Iliad, skill at weaving was listed as being among the top criteria by which women were judged and for which they were valued. To the Romans, a woman's place was in her home, and the fact that this is where Lucretia is found further attests to her superiority. It also speaks to her modesty, which was a much praised quality in Roman women. Finally, Lucretia scorned socializing with other women in favor of hard labor for the benefit of her family. These qualities of having skill at sewing, staying at home, being a hard worker, were precisely those most commonly used to praise women on their tombstones, and thus clearly reflect the Roman ideal, at least among Roman men, of what a Roman woman should be. The second half of Lucretia's story features her displaying additional virtues. When threatened by Tarquinius with the choice of yielding to his lust or being killed, she unhesitatingly chooses death. In doing so, she demonstrates great courage. What eventually causes her to submit to Tarquinius is not the threat of bodily harm, but rather the fear that her honor will be disgraced if Tarquinius frames her to give the impression that she was having an affair with a slave. She thus shares with the Roman men the ideal that one's reputation is even more important than one's life. After Tarquinius leaves, Lucretia summons her husband, informs him of her rape, and commits suicide. This is a troubling episode, since even though she herself admits she's not guilty, she punishes herself anyway. Her stated reason for this extreme action is telling. She says, she does not want to provide a precedent for future unfaithful women to cite in order to escape punishment. She's thus represented as being self-consciously aware of her potential as a role model and an exemplar, and is determined to set the bar of moral rectitude as high as possible. Again, she's more concerned with protecting her reputation 
and perhaps even more importantly, that of her husband and her family than she is with preserving her own security and happiness. Now, from a modern perspective, the fact that one of the main examples of behavior presented to young Roman girls for emulation involved a woman who is raped and commits suicide is rather disturbing. One characteristic shared by the accounts of male Roman heroes such as Mucius, Horatius, and Cincinnatus is that each is threatened with what looks like certain death, but in the end, all three survive and are showered with honors and rewards. Lucretia, the lone female protagonist, however, is the unlucky hero who actually dies rather than live happily ever after. This story probably reveals more about Roman males' fears and concerns than it does about the behavior of actual Roman women. Uh, one can only speculate how the story might have been different if Roman women had been allowed to write their own accounts of female role models and heroines. Finally, in addition to offering moral instruction, Lucretia's tale also has vital significance in Roman history. The consequences of the famous anti-king oath taken by Brutus are the end of the monarchy and the creation of the republic. It's intriguing that this crucial moment in Roman history is thus prompted not by the actions of a man, but rather those of a woman. While this story tells us a great deal about Roman values, it's far less certain how accurately it reflects the historical moment when the republic